Kicking off the orthopedics tailored to the high yield emergency medicine shelf review, there's a couple things I want to highlight for pediatrics in general, which is one, the Salter Harris fractures, and then two, child abuse, how to find it, how to diagnose it, etc. So for Salter Harris fractures, these are fractures that can affect the growth plate. And if they are not treated, they can actually complicate the growth for the child and, and stunt the growth. So these often occur in long bones, and if you just want to follow through, I've made a chart here, type 1 through 5. It spells it out for you, uh, Salter, S-A-L-T-E-R. So type 1 is slip, 2 above, 3 lower, 4 through, and then 5 erasing the growth plate or it's disruption of growth plate. So that's going to usually be like compressed. The big thing for the child abuse is... You're going to see like a vertebral compression fracture, mid-shaft humerus or mid-shaft tibial fracture, rib fractures. You need to have a high suspicion whenever you see those in children in particular. The best test is a skeletal survey, which is basically a series of x-rays of all the, the major bones of the body and should be done in all cases of suspected child abuse. For the ankle and foot, just a few disorders here. Achilles tendon rupture is seen in weekend warriors or those that are recreational athletes. They're going to have pain on sudden dorsi or plantar flexion while trying to take off on a jump or run or sprint, for example. It can happen after ciprofloxacin use as well. They're going to hear a pop, sudden pain in the back of the ankle. The Thompson test is a failure to plantar flex when the physician squeezes the calf. The treatment is splint and equine position with gradual dorsiflexion to a more neutral position. Some of these patients will go on and eventually need surgery. Gastrocnemius rupture, it's associated with sudden changes in direction like tennis they're going to have a negative Thompson test. The big one here uh, for Ottawa ankle and Ottawa foot criteria is the you need to discern whether or not the patient may have a fracture and will need under to undergo further testing. So for the ankle criteria, if the patient has malleolar tenderness at the posterior edge of either malleolus or inability to bear weight, they need to go to imaging to assess for fracture. And then for the Ottawa foot criteria, they're going to have pain in the midfoot, tenderness at the base of the fifth metatarsal, inability to bear weight, and that will require imaging as well. And then really quickly, the most common ankle sprain is the anterior talofibular ligament, the ATFL. Calcaneus fracture is the most common tarsal bone fracture. The patient may have fallen off a ladder and landed on their feet, for example. Uh, and this is when you would also check for lumbosacral fractures in, in the event that they fell from the story and they have a, a high height and they have a calcaneal fracture. A Liss Frank fracture is a patient will fall while their foot folds underneath them. It's an intra-articular fracture of the base of the second metatarsal with widening of the space between the first and second metatarsals. Initial x-rays are going to often be normal and it's beneficial to get weight-bearing films. The most most of the time, these are going to require open reduction and internal fixation. Tarsal tunnel syndrome is due to entrapment of neuropathy involving the posterior tibial nerve, and pain at night is common in these patients. Plantar fasciitis is inflammation of the plantar fascia on the sole of the foot due to overuse. Pain is worse during the first few steps of the day. The treatment is rest in uh, NSAIDs. Severs disease, also known as calcaneal ap- apophysitis, Its causes are non-traumatic heel pain due to teenagers' growth, plates expanding, and the treatment is NSAIDs. And then briefly briefly for the spine, you want to use nexus criteria to guide decision-making after blunt trauma to the C-spine. If a patient presents with neurological deficits, uh, the spinal midline tenderness, or they're disoriented or intoxicated, or some sort of distracting injury, you want to get imaging. And in general, if there's a spinal fracture present, the entire spine needs to be imaged. Unstable C-spine injuries include Jefferson's fracture, bilateral cervical facet dislocation, odontinoid atlantal occipital dislocation, hangman's fracture, and teardrop fractures. For the knee and neighboring anatomy, ACL, MCL, and medial meniscus tear is called the unhappy triad. Meniscal tears are often caused by clicking, catching, or locking of the joint during motion of the knee. Oshkud slaughter disease is an anterior knee pain localized to the tibial tuberosity. It's exclusively in adolescence. Treatment is NSAIDs and rest. Patellar dislocation almost always is disco- dislocated laterally. You reduce it with extension of the knee and manually displacing the patella medially. It's very common that these are going to reoccur.
A knee dislocation, on the other hand, is often due to high in energy injury. It it's often reduces spontaneously, but you need to consult orthopedic surgeons emergently. You need to be cautious of the popliteal artery and perineal nerves. Almost all knee dislocations, you need to consult vascular surgery as well because you need to get an arteriogram to evaluate for arterial injury. Baker cyst, that's when you're going to see swelling in the popliteal fossa due to enlargement of gastrocnemius bursa. It can rupture leading to acute onset of severe pain that looks and feels like a DVT. You're going to feel erythema, warm tenderness in the calf. And while diagnosis is clinical, an ultrasound is really helpful to make sure that you rule out a DVT. A quadricep tendon rupture, these patients are often elderly. The x-ray is going to show a low riding patella. And then patella tendon rupture, on the other hand, um, those are often young athletes, and the x-ray will show a high-riding patella. A tibial plateau fracture often involves a lateral plateau. You want to assess for perineal, perineal nerve function, remember, because that's the perineal nerve will run out in that direction. And the treatment is open reduction internal fixation. Compartment syndrome can occur with trauma, including open fractures, burns, tight casts, you're going to see it uh, more so with tibial and forearm fractures. It's a clinical diagnosis with the six P's of pain, pallor, paresthesia, paralysis, poikilothermia, and pulselessness. The treatment is fasciotomy. This one is a favorite discerning the difference between spondyloliasis and spondylolisthesis. Spondylolisthesis. Low lysis is a defect in the pars interarticularis. It's technically a fracture that is often due to microtrauma. Uh, think stress fractures, for example. And then spondylolisthesis is the same defect with, well, the only difference is that it's the same issue, but you also have anterior displacement of the vertebrae. Spinal stenosis is an abnormal narrowing of the spinal canal leading to pressure on the cord. Patients present with pain, numbness, weakness in the arms, or weakness in the legs. L5 is the most commonly involved vertebrae, and treatment is NSAIDs, physical therapy, steroid shot, and then surgery. Piriformis syndrome is Sciatica ultimately results from irritation of compression of the sciatic nerve by the piriformis muscle, and this can occur from repetitive microtrauma or just prolonged sedentary life sitting. Straight leg test has a very good sensitivity but poor specificity. It's considered a positive only if the patient complains of radicular pain radiating down the leg past the knee. Crossed straight leg test is when the unaffected leg is raised and elicits radicular pain, which is almost pathognomonic. It's got a very high specificity. The pain elicited at 30 to 7 degrees of leg elevation, you want to think about a herniated disc with nerve root compression. And then pain arises less than 30 degrees. Think about an abscess, tumor, spondylolisthesis, for example. Pelvic and hips. So if the pelvis is unstable, you want to wrap it with bed sheets or other compressive devices. Treat hypotension aggressively with transfusion and do not place a foley if there's urethral injury or you suspect urethral injury. You want to recall that urethral injury should be on the differential if you see any one of these three things, which one is blood at the urethral meatus, two, high riding prostate, and or three, scrotal hematoma. Get a retrograde urethrogram to assess the status of the urethra. An open book fracture is... Uh, you'll see a widened pubic symphysis, typically results from an anterior posterior compression or also known as a crush injury. The treatment is angiography with embolization and surgical fixation. You want to place a pelvic binder at the level of the greater trochanters. For hip fractures, you're often going to see the leg in, is externally rotated and shortened. And femoral neck fractures, those have a high incidence of avascular necrosis, whereas lesser trochanter fractures, they're the most common in young adults due to forceful contraction of the iliopsoas. In terms of hip dislocations here, most of the time the leg is going to be internally rotated and shortened. Um, however, the posterior type is uh, the most common and the mechanism is usually due to the knee bracing the dashboard and, uh, and motor vehicle collision, for example. You want to determine if there's a vascular necrosis present, so a physician should always order an MRI in hip dislocations. You want to assess the nerve status, especially the sciatic nerve, by testing for dorsiflexion on physical examination. Femur fractures avoid traction and femoral neck fractures. The treatment is uh, open reduction internal fixation. And slipped capital femoral epiphysis, that's seen in obese adolescent males. You diagnose with an x-ray and the treatment is 
open reduction internal fixation. Transient synovitis, you're going to see this when a child comes in, they're going to have a limp. It's often associated with a recent viral infection, trauma, or or vaccination actually too. You want to rule out septic arthritis uh, with a CBC, ESR, CRP. The treatment is NSAIDs. And then septic arthritis is most commonly due to staph aureus. You diagnose via needle aspiration. We've talked about that already in a couple other videos. And then lastly, you have lay leg calf perth disease. It's avascular necrosis of the femoral head, typically um, children ranging from four to six years in age with pain and limp. X-ray will often be negative. Get an MRI or bone scan to evaluate and the treatment is conservative. Uh, parenchyma infection is an infection of the nail fold. It's commonly caused by staph aureus. The treatment is drainage and antibiotics. Bella infection is an infection of the distal pulp. It's caused by staph aureus. The treatment is drainage and antibiotics. And if you don't treat this one, it's going to progress to osteomyelitis or tenosynovitis. Herpetic Whitlow is a painful lesion at the fingertip caused by HSV, typically seen in dishwashers or dental hygienists. The treatment is supportive. And if you try and drain this, it's just going to lead to further infection. So just leave it alone. Supportive treatment. A boutonniere deformity is when the extensor tendon... Uh, has a central slip, as in the joint is stuck in the pip, which is flexion, and the dip, which is leads to hyperextension. It occurs in lacerations, jammed fingers, arthritis. The treatment involves splinting, and if you're not treating this, it can progress to needing surgery. Mount finger is when the extensor tendon ruptures or an avulsion fracture is at the base of the distal phalanx. It is caused by forced flexion of dip. It's often from a direct blow. Uh, of the t- fingertips and the treatment is you just want to splint the distal tip and and just keep it in extension. Subanguinal hematomas are hematomas underneath the nail. If they're present and painful, the next best step is to perform trepanation. I think I did one of these when I was in medical school and basically you just go ahead and take like a sterile needle or something and um, circularly in a circular motion go in through the nail and release the blood and the patient usually feels better after that. Weakness in the pincer grasp, I want you to think about gamekeeper's thumb. This occurs in skiers, football players. It affects the ulnar collateral ligament and is completely torn. The patient will need to go to surgery. Otherwise, just rest and splint. Boxer's fractures are fractured at the neck of the fifth metacarpal. Bennett's fractures are fractured at the base of the first metacarpal and is in intra-articular in origin. That's contrasted to Orlando's fracture, which is also at the base of the first metacarpal, and it's a comminuted intra-articular fracture. A fight bite is when a fist is, strikes uh, someone else's teeth. You always give antibiotics in these fractures. You want to give IV if it's an open fracture, and these bites are at risk of infection since the extensor tendon and the MCP joints are relatively avascular, so they don't get a lot of blood supply. And so they have a, they have a limited ability um, to combat infection. The third MCP joint of the dominant hand is the most often affected and antibiotics are necessary to prevent tenosynovitis. Speaking of tenosynovitis, canavel sign is for flexor tenosynovitis and it includes any of the following fusiform swelling or a sausage digit, a finger stuck in flex position, pain with extension, which is the earliest sign, and tenderness along the flexor tendon. So that kind of gives you an indication if uh, the patient has tenosynovitis in any in any of those symptoms. A high pressure injury can be seen when a paintball gun is shot at someone's hand. Initially, it's going to appear like there's nothing wrong and it's just a small wound and these can quickly digress into compartment syndrome or lead to ischemia. The next best test in this case um, is to consult orthopedic surgery. Accidental EpiPen administration into a fingertip is treated with topical nitroglycerin paste to the affected area, and you want to put the hand in warm water to promote vasodilation. If nitroglycerin is not available, choose fentolamine. All right, Collie's fracture is basically what you'll see in a falling on the outstretched hand. It's mostly in those that are older, 50 and above. It's a distal radius fracture with dorsal displacement. You want to assess the median nerve function. The treatment is closed reduction. Smith fracture is also a distal radius fracture, but it has a volar displacement. That's the difference between Collie's and Smith. The treatment is also closed reduction. Barton's fracture is a distal radius fracture with dislocation of the radiocarpal joint. The most common fracture... Uh, slash dislocation of the wrist, and it requires external fixation and surgery.
Then we're going to switch over to some disorders that primarily cause uh, the treatment is splinting, but then if things don't work out, obviously, then you'll go ahead and do surgery. So let's start with the scaphoid fracture. That's basically, if you remember the anatomical snuff box, it's going to have tenderness there. Your x-ray is going to be unremarkable, and that's classic for scaphoid fracture. Because the blood supply runs distal to proximal, on the scaphoid bone, it's at very high risk of avascular necrosis. Every patient that has a negative x-ray, but you have a very high suspicion for scaphoid fracture, they need to have a thumb spica splint and follow up with outpatient. The triquetrum is the second most commonly fractured bone behind the scaphoid. The scaphoid lunate disassociation is the most common uh, ligamentous injury of the hand. If it's greater than three millimeters separation, it's suggested of a scaphoid lunate dissociation. If it's greater than five millimeter separation between the two bones, that confirms the diagnosis. The treatment is thumb spick a splint and orthopedic referral for operative repair. Carpal tunnel syndrome is entrapment of the median nerve. The risk factors include pregnancy, diabetes, hypothyroidism, rheumatoid arthritis, Failing sign is hyperflexion of both wrists with reproducible paresthesias in the median nerve distribution. Tunnel sign, on the other hand, I want you to T, Tunnel's tapping T. Let's both have T. So Tunnel sign is tapping the volar wrist. Uh, you'll have paresthesias in the median nerve distribution as well. The treatment is splint, NSAIDs, steroid injections, and then surgery if those fail. Guillain's canal syndrome is... Uh, basically formed by a ligament connecting the pisiform to the hamate and contains the ulnar nerve. That's what the Guillain's canal is. The symptoms include numbness, tingling, and the ulnar nerve distribution this time. It's often due to repetitive trauma like bicycle, bicyclists holding handlebars or those people, you know, swinging golf clubs, for example. The treatment is NSAID splint and then surgery for decompression. Dequirane's tenosynovitis is overuse of the extensor pollicis brevis and abductor pollicis longus. Finkelstein's test is when you ulnar deviate um, of the fist, it's going to reproduce that pain. And the treatment is splint and NSAIDs. And the treatment of wrist drop is just splint with wrist extension. Remember that th that's due to compression of the radial nerve. There's a mnemonic to discern Monteju and Galeazzi fractures. It's M-U-G-R. Monteju is ulnar. Galeazzi is radial fracture or radius fracture. So Monteju fractures are ulnar fractures with radial head dislocations. Galeazzi fractures are fracture of the radia radius with a distal radial ulnar joint dislocation. Nightstick fracture refers to a non-displaced ulnar shaft fracture, and it's the most important nerve. You want to assess the radial nerve. Volkmann's contracture occurs when there's inadequate circulation to the forearm, which is often caused by a tight cast or swelling. It results in the forearm pronation, uh, wrist flexion, and paralysis of the intrinsic muscles. Radial head fracture occurs after a fall on an outstretched hand. The treatment is conservative. Lateral epicondylitis is most common overuse injury of the elbow, and the treatment is just rest and NSAIDs, and the treatment of medial epicondylitis is the same, just NSAIDs and rest. Olecranon bursitis is produced by, repeti by repetitive mi uh, micro tra traumas, which lead, uh, like leaning on the elbow, for instance. Septic bursitis occurs almost exclusively in the olecranon or prepatella bursa. It's most often staph aureus and diagnosed via aspiration of the fluid. The treatment is antibiotics, of course. Nursemaid elbow can be seen in children who are pulled or swung by their arms. The kid will um, hold their arm in a flexed and pronated state. And the anatomical deficit is subluxation of the radial head. The x-ray will be normal. And the treatment is supinate the forearm and flex the elbow, or you just hyperpronate. Elbow dislocations. Uh, the posterior, posterior dislocations are the most common. You want to assess the brachial artery and ulnar nerve. Uh, the treatment is closed reduction. You want to reassess the neurovasculature uh, function after the reduction. Supracondylar fractures are often seen in children. You want to also assess the neurovascular status again as well, which is the brachial artery and median nerve in this case. The most common shoulder dislocation is anterior dislocation, which accounts for 95% of all dislocations. 5% are posterior, and those are often associated with electrical injuries and seizures. Anterior dislocations... Um, the patient will hold the arm in an abduction and external rotation. Uh, it's the opposite for posterior dislocations.
And then inferior dislocations, that's a little bit more rare, but that's when the forearm is locked overhead from forceful hyper abduction. There's a high complication rate with these, so it's often associated with rotator cuff issues as well. And speaking of rotator cuff, that's composed of those four sits muscles, right? So supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. A treatment for rotator cuff injury is sling, and you want to refer them to orthopedics uh, for uh, surgery and repair. And then humerus fracture, the proximal fractures affects the axillary nerve while the midshaft affect the radial nerve. And I'll, I'll have a chart for this uh, uh, for you to just view as well. And then thoracic outlet syndrome, that's just compression of the either brachial plexus, subclavian artery, or subclavian vein uh, when the thoracic outlet is narrowed. And the symptoms will depend on which one of those are affected. And the treatments are also targeted to the underlying etiology. And then here's just a last minute chart review for the various fractures and then what is the most commonly affected nerve for each fracture. And I know this was a lot. This is a tough subject, orthopedics. Uh, I know it's a lot. And if you have any questions, please reach out. And I hope that this video was helpful for you and good luck on your shelf and the rest of your examinations.